Yeah, I uh, speak. Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, uh, welcome to my talk on uh, what role um, did free software play during the crisis, um, or will play during the crisis, or also for ongoing crisis. You never know. Um, and uh, my name is Alexander Sander. I'm um, FSFE's senior policy consultant. And we are the Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, this is a charity that empowers users to control technology. And we do believe that this is done through the help of free software. And um, part of our work is, for example, to do policy related activities, so lobbying uh, across Europe. And uh, for example, also in Brussels, in order to make sure that uh, free software plays an uh, important role in lawmaking. And uh, in this regard, we also um, yeah, follow the crisis and have um, checked out what, um, um, where free software can play a role. Um, and um, you might remember, especially in the beginning of the corona crisis, we uh, kicked it off with closing the borders. And that's a huge issue. As you know, um, the freedom of movement for people, but also for goods, is a fundamental right in the European Union. And so with this, um, yeah, we had a huge issue in the European Union. And, um, <laughs> and um, so uh, we thought about how can we uh, make sure that we can open the borders again. And in the very beginning, um, one of these ideas, for example, was to introduce tracing apps or other digital solutions. And uh, with these tracing apps, we were thinking about um, that, the, uh, that these apps might help us yeah, in order to open borders again, but also um, we had other issues like homeworking, and um, this was true for us at FSFE. So we uh, went into homeworking, but all of you as well, and also administrations went into homeworking, like our governments. And um, especially governments and administrations were using proprietary, proprietary software in the beginning, something like Microsoft Teams or um, Zoom was heavily used, and this comes with data protection issues. And as data protection and the protection of um, yeah, our privacy is also a fundamental right, um, we've been also working on this issue. And in the next 20 minutes, I will tell you a bit uh, yeah, what happened uh, in the last years on this and how um, yeah, our public bodies reacted on the situation with the tracing apps, but also um, with home office and uh, privacy and so on. As said, uh, for us, free software plays an important role, but uh, we've seen also in this crisis that there have been huge debates about the use of free software when it comes to digital sovereignty. We've heard uh, Italo's talk uh, in the morning on this, and uh, we know that if we want to be digital sovereign, there's only one way how we can achieve this, by using free software. Just to bring us all on the same page, what is free software? Free software always comes with four freedoms. The freedom to use, to study, to share, and to improve. So whenever we have these four freedoms, it's free software, also known as free and open source software, open source software, libre software, um, and so on. And so um, these four freedoms is so we can use the software for any purpose without any, uh, without any restrictions. So we can do whatever we want with the software. We can study the code. So we have transparent code so we can see what the software is going to do. It, the code can be analyzed by anyone. This is particularly important um, when we want to see if, for example, fundamental rights are protected. So if we want to see if we give our data to somebody um, that the data really stay uh, where they are supposed to stay. Also, we are free to share the software. This is also very important. And this is also something we have seen um, during the crisis a lot. Um, so also here, there are no limitations. And even if we are talking about free software, it doesn't matter uh, that it's free in terms of money. So you can earn money with free software. You don't have to, but you can. And it's also done. So the price doesn't matter, but it's yeah, free to share. And in the end, you are free to, we say, improve the software. But let's say you can modify it. So you can also yeah um, destroy the software if you want or make it worse. Um, but um, yeah, as we want to move forward, we say we want to improve the software, um, but one could also say to modify the software. So as we have this transparent code, um, we can use this code and modify it. And then again, we are sharing um, the result also again with everybody. So whenever we have these four freedoms, use, um, study, share, and improve, then it is free software. And as you can already see from here, it helps a lot um, if you want to protect fundamental rights and if you 
um, want to foster innovation, and this is particularly good if you are in a crisis. Um, to make it a bit more clear, um, let's uh, have a look on um, what problems we have with proprietary software. Also here we've um, heard already something in the talk by Talu in the morning. Um, so, for example, we have no interoperability, so it's hard to work together with other systems. So you are once in once you are in this vendor login. So once you are um, yeah um, owned by a company like Microsoft, then it's really hard to get out there and to work together with the others. Um, so like sharing documents, for example, or using other programs like I don't know if you have um, a, want to edit a document and then use a mail program and continue from there on. It's really hard to get out of this uh, vendor login because you have no interoperability. That's um, particular a huge issue on if you want to work together across borders. And um, for example, if you are governments together with other gov governments. And this also comes with uh, unpredictable costs, um, first of all, for maintenance, uh, but also like for future um, 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 software updates or upgrades, for example. So you never know how much it will cost you. Um, in the future, because once you are in this vendor login, the vendor can um, say what the price is, and um, yeah, there are no any uh, no other choices for you on the market because you are in this vendor login. And also, if you ha as you have to pay for licenses, that also means that your investments are lost. So just to get the software, you're paying for licenses, and these um, license fees are yeah, these investments in license fees are just lost, and the money goes to Ireland and. Um, then it's over there. And we've also seen, um, especially um, with the tracing apps, for example, um, that there's a low acceptance by citizens because we don't have transparent code and we can't see what the software is going to do. So we don't know if our um, data, for example, are uh, protected. And in the end, we have um, security issues. So again, as we don't have um, um, transparent code, it's um, not that easy to find backdoors, for example, and um, so the solution, on the other hand, then is free software because we have this interoperability due to open standards by default. So everything um, comes with um, yeah interoperability by default as everything is open, as we have these four freedoms. And thus, we can make sure um, we can work across systems and um, then also borders. Um, so we have a huge independence through the free licenses. And um, thus, we can also collaborate. And through collaboration, we can um, not only um, yeah, share expertise, but also risks and costs. So um, we can collaborate by saying, especially when it comes to administrations, we are putting together our money and invest in one software project. And as we are then um, free to use it um, on as many workstations as we want, for example, we can share costs. And also, if you want to make huge investments in software, um, you can share risks um, by this. And also, you can bring in others. So that uh, means you are not only bringing in coders into software development, but also others like during Corona, for example, um, experts for um, diseases. And um, also, we have seen a lot that whenever um, especially governments and administrations invest into um, free software, that, um, it comes to involvement of local partners, so we are not working with the um, big um, tech companies from the US, but we are um, working together with local companies, and that also helps us to foster our local IT market, which is um, yeah good for our economy, um, but also for our knowledge on software. It is transparent by default. This helps us. Um, um, yeah, to get the acceptance by citizens, we can see what the software is going to do and if it's um, yeah, protecting our rights. And by this transparency, we also have this um, possibility to fix the security issues uh, a bit easier. So free software is not secure by default, but due to the transparent code, it is possible for everyone to check the code and to see if there are backdoors or if there are any security issues. And for example, it's um, easy to run hackathons or back, uh, bug bounties, for example, in order to find um, security issues. And also, you don't have to go to the vendor afterwards and ask them to fix the security issue. You can fix the security issue um, by your own or together with the help of others directly and give it back to the community, which is also a major win. So if you, for example, look at the um, known bugs at 
um, proprietary software which are still not fixed because of um, economy reasons, then um, you see why it's a very good idea to go to free software projects because there um, you can fix the security issues by yourself or um, others can do this and um, yeah, it could be just done and everybody can see um, what has been done and this is why it helps you to have a more secure software product in the end. So let's see um, concretely what happened during the corona crisis. So first of all, um, we can say that the, it was or it's still a global crisis and this global crisis comes with similar demands. So um, more or less all governments in the, in the world had the same issues in order to tackle the crisis. And especially when it came to software, um, solutions had to be more or less the same. Um, so it was clear that we need specific hardware, but it was also clear that we need, needed specific software. And this was true for home office, remote working, just think about like um, conference tools, um, collaboration tools, and so on. So this was needed everywhere, um, even if it was private, public, or um, business. And um, especially when we are talking about these tracing or certificate apps, um, which are around. So this is also true um, for these apps that they had to be um, somewhere accepted everywhere. So because else um, this cross-border checking and cross-border tracking wouldn't have been possible. But also if you want to show your certificate, not only in Spain, but if you go to, I don't know, Germany, for example, and want to show it there, it must be um, sure that there is, for example, a translation in place and that people uh, across the border understand what they are seeing here. So the solution, first of all, is that we needed interoperability, yeah? because without any interoperability, we couldn't do cross-border tracking. So, um, and we need the independence through free license to make sure that across borders, um, we could work together and see, um, for example, yeah, only through um, a translation, but that the back end is more or less the same, um, that we can yeah, independently um, um, accept what's coming from another country. And also what we have seen um, with the um, um, developing of these tracing apps, for example, that um, collaboration is needed, not only again, um, only on code, but also for translations, for example, but also expertise on um, yeah, how Corona is spread in general. So we also needed to uh, reach out to other groups of people um, and scientists who told us um, how to design a software and what should it do the software. So, and here a collaboration, not only on code happened, but also a broader discussion on how um, the design of these apps, for example, should look like, um, how we handle uh, certificates, and for example, then also how do we protect our data. So there was, for example, a huge discussion if we want to have a centralized storage of our data or a decentralized uh, storage of our data. And this is also part of the software project. And this discussion was only possible because we had open standards and we had transparent code and thus we could see um, how our data are stored. And by thus, we could go out and say to the people, um, you can use this. And not only the government said it, but also, for example, NGOs who checked the code then and said, um, um, you can use the software because we had the transparent code and see what happened here. So, and this transparency had for acceptance by citizens um, because, um, yeah, if only two people for example, use these tracing apps, then it's useless. It only makes sense if a lot of people use it and therefore we needed a lot of acceptance and this acceptance came um, due to the use of free software. Again, um, we could uh, involve uh, a lot of stakeholders and um, so let's have a concrete look. Uh, at the very beginning, we had these tracing apps and um, um, we, yeah, after a few days after the discussion about these tracing apps started, we came out with a press release and reached out to decision makers and uh, had three demands for them. So first of all, all of these apps need to be used voluntarily. They need to respect fundamental rights and therefore they need to be free software in order to make sure that, we, so okay, voluntary use, uh, that's not a free software issue, but in order to see if we can um, say it's respect fundamental rights, therefore it needs to be free software. And with this demand, uh, we, yeah, uh, reach out to the media, but also to decision makers. And this quickly led to the um, conclusion, first of all, by the World Health Organization, 
that was in May 2020, where they said, um, first of all, these tracing apps need to be full transparent, and thus they need to be open source, so free software. So even the World Health Organization quickly recognized and said for the yeah, world <laughs> that it's a very good idea to do these tracing apps or uh, contact tracing apps for COVID-19 as open source because else um, we will run into issues and won't have this acceptance by citizens and um, will have problems. And also we need this interoperability to do cross-border tracking, right? Um, same is true for the um, e-health network of the European Union. The e-health network is the European Commission, the European Parliament, and all member states of the European Union. So this is a, a huge network, um, which we, where we can say in the end it's the European Union. Um, and they also um, yeah, um, wrote a paper on a common toolbox for member states, um, how to do um, these tracing um, and uh, that was uh, also in the beginning of uh, April 2020. And also there, they recommended um, that it should be openly published. So first of all, the technical specif specifications, but also the source code. And uh, that's very important. They said for to maximize reuse, interoperability, auditability, and security. Yeah, so they fully followed our arguments here. So and that's very interesting that they not only talked about interoperability, because so far, whenever we talk to the European Union, um, it was a lot about interoperability, but they never ever talked about reuse. Um, they rarely talked about uh, audible code and never about security. So, and that was completely new. So that due to these um, COVID tracing apps, they started to use um, all the other arguments as well. So, and it's a, this, this argument stays alone, right? So it's not only about tracing apps. So they figured out that when we talk about free software open source, it's good to reuse it. So as we are several member states, and then it's good for security and so on. So that was a very important paper, and we are still using this paper today for um, doing lobbying in the European Union, because um, yeah, um, as they or what what they said <laughs> back in 2020 is also still true today, not only for COVID tra uh, tracing, but for all applications public bodies use. Most of the European member states followed. In Spain, for example, we had this um, RADA COVID app, which was uh, released under MPL license. In German, we had the Corona tracing app, also released under free software license. A few member states didn't follow. It. France, for example, they uh, choose their own solution, and they did a central storage, not a decentralized one. Um, but in the end, we have seen that the huge debate um, about data protection, privacy, helped a lot um, in Europe to firstly release these tools uh, under a free software license. And um, no matter if these tools are in the end very useful or not, so this is not the discussion. We had a discussion about if such a software could help us, then it needs to be free software, and that's the most important part here. So, and this is what uh, still helps us today. And um, also, again, we had these, uh, after the tracing apps, we had the certificate apps. So now where we can all run around and show that we are um, got our vaccination or that we are tested. Um, they are again released under a free software license. And here the interesting part is that, um, for example, um, we see some differences again. So, um, but um, in Germany, for example, these, we call it CovPass app, um, was only released on the um, um, Apple and the, the Google Play Store. But due to the code, um, our, our community have been able to also put it to F-Troid. So um, it um, was also possible for um, yeah, uh, people not using Google or um, Apple phones to download these apps and to use these apps on um, phones without any proprietary software. So here we can see that even a community can step in, in terms of health, use the code, and make sure um, that um, yeah, people can have the control over their technology and therefore also their data. And also what we have seen later on is that uh, back in October 2020, the European Commission then came up with a general open source strategy. Um, so this is also um, the first time that the European Commission um, had a strong saying on um, open source and that they want to go into the direction in the next three years to think open and um, to use 
more free software. However, um, this document is full of loopholes. Um, we criticized it a lot. Um, so they, for example, said they want to use uh, open source when there are good reasons to do so, um, whatever this means. Um, wherever it makes sense, they want to use open source, so nobody knows what this means. Um, they also want to set up a small program office, so there, in the end, is no budget, there are no persons assigned to this. Um, but still, we have this document as a first step um, where the European Commission, after this specific um, um, outreach on these tracing apps, came up with a document where they said, for our own administrations, we need to make sure that we um, use more free software um, because we figured out that it might be a good idea during the crisis. And that's why, um, yeah, we also run this campaign, um, also mentioned by Italo, um, public money, public code, where we say publicly financed software must be made publicly available under a free software license. So whenever it's public money, it should be public code as well. And um, so our learning from this crisis is that it's more important than ever before. And therefore, <laughs> I skipped some slides. <laughs> and um, um, I uh, want to show you this campaign. It is also already uh, supported by um, many organizations, also some administrations uh, supported, like uh, in Spain, the city of uh, Barcelona or the um, Parliament in Asturias um, support uh, our campaign. So if you haven't signed this campaign, feel free to, so to do so. You can do it uh, individually, uh, but also with the organization. And if you want to learn more in general about the campaign, we are giving uh, Lina and me tomorrow a workshop at 12 Sorry, I think um, where we tell you what we are doing with this campaign concretely, how we reach out to administrations, how we convince them, uh, which wording we are using, which tone, and um, yeah, how we make sure that um, administrations, governments uh, are using free software not only in crisis but also in general and spend our money, taxpayers' money, to invest in free software and not in proprietary software and so on. And with this, I'm going to end this talk, and uh, I have one minute left for questions. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Also, uh, Lina speaks Spanish, so if you uh, don't want to do it in English, uh, you can reach out to her in Spanish. <laughs> Thanks a lot.